Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Howdy. Hope everybody's doing well. I have two uh, quick announcements, little points of business, and then we're going to get to our next speaker. Um, announcement number one is that, as you can see on the board, there's a QR code. Our next speaker is a CME speaker. If you need to get your CME, you need to scan this QR code, follow the directions, and that is how you're going to claim your CME for the, uh, for the entire conference. Very important. Please take your phones out and scan the QR code. Second point of information is that I know that many of you are anticipating flights and whatnot this afternoon, this evening. I know some of y'all are thinking about floating out of here. Um, we'd like to ask all of y'all to please partake of some lunch before you go. We have some to-go lunches. They're going to be in the far corner of the uh, of, of Texas Grand. So please, if you're floating out, humble us to please take lunch with you. With that, um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, part of Umur Sehat, part of SBMA, has always been that we are powered by remarkable individuals. Mullah, Mullah guides us, and as doctors, we all take up the helm of these initiatives, and we take up Mullah's Farman, and we run with them. And this is my favorite part of being part of Umur Sehat, part of being Part, my favorite part of being a member of SBMA. And the next three speakers are all doctors who have done just that, taken initiative, taken personal initiative, taken guidance through Akamola and what Akamola's teachings have told us. And they've taken this initiative and they've flown with it. Um, and in that way, these three physicians have inspire all of us. And it's my great honor to introduce the first speaker, our CME speaker, Dr. Moish Shafiq, who he hails from the great state of Texas, and uh, he's actually Dallas born and Dallas proud. So uh, um, he did, he's lived here all his life. He doesn't, he doesn't twang as much as I do. He did he did his internal medicine training at UT Southwestern. Thereafter, he did a two-year NIH research and clinical fellowship in hypertension. Uh, he did go to Florida for a little while, but we got him back here as fast as we could, where he did his cardiology fellowship. Uh, Moisebai took an academic position at the UT Health Science Center in San Antonio as well. He's been back in Dallas now for about eight years. He's currently the medical director of cardiology at one of our local hospitals, Medical City, Louisville, where he also serves as the current chief of staff. Aside from hypertension, Moisebai has a special interest in preventative cardiology, and near and dear to my heart on a very personal level, he's a great friend and the amazing father of three beautiful children. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Moise Shafiq. Run Divas Bellano conversation. I'll just let you guys kind of read through that for a second. So the first thing, a public service announcement. If you haven't set your lineups, it's probably too late. I think lineup locks have already gone. Dr. Manasawala, if you're still here, you are unfortunately still stuck with Sam Howell. Jay Houston, good luck with CJ Stroud, but you guys should ask Dr. Musa Boy how 
Justin Fields went for him. So good luck with that. Hey, Biju. I'm supposed to try to keep your attention. So Dr. Jose Vabai has told me that I am allowed to throw stuff into the crowd. Okay? Because I will be throwing stuff. And I'm going to start with the back to try to keep you guys awake. Okay, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I, I, we have a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to get started. I unfortunately have no disclosures. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, Joe, so what we're going to try to do quickly here is we're going to discuss coronary atherosclerosis and what that is and what is the pathophysiology of that. I, I'm going to try to do this medically and somewhat non-medically because when I cover check it, they're not medical, and I want to try to include everyone into this as well. We're going to talk about traditional risk factors for developing heart disease and blockages. We're going to discuss risk prognostication and possible screening modalities. I'm going to zero in on one, and that is coronary artery calcium scoring and how we employed that here in our Jumat and in Dallas. The statistics inside of Jarek Saru Heart disease is the leading cause of death in basically every population in the United States every single year. COVID na time ma bi ekdam fila, you know, COVID ekdam fila bi to heart disease was still the number one killer. I think COVID got up to third, but heart disease was still the number one killer at that time. One person every th every 36 seconds in the United States dies of cardiovascular disease, and about 660,000 people die in the U.S. every year. That's one in four deaths. Let's talk about atherosclerosis. This is a term you might have heard, and in short, it just means blockage formation. Dr. Yamani's napping. So, you know, the, the link that most people make is that, you know, the, the, uh, what is on the left is going to cause what's going on in the, on the right. And the, the right side is an angiogram, and there's a blockage there. But this is part of the equation. It is not the complete equation. So the process of atherosclerosis, this is the process of forming blockages. If you can imagine, this is a cross-section of a blood vessel here. And you think of it as a pipe, a PVC pipe. So the first thing that, you know, when, it, when it's completely normal and that's on the far left, the pipe's completely open. But within the vessel wall, you start to develop something called a fatty streak. And this is where fat is started, it starts to be laid down. And this is a progressive process that grows over time. You start forming something called a fibrous plaque, and then it becomes an atherosclerotic plaque, and then you, it can rupture, and it can cause all kinds of bad things. But this is the... It's a, it's a process, it's an indolent process. It takes, it, it takes time for this to progress to what happens on the right where you have a full blockage. But this is the most sciencey slide I have and I apologize, but I'm gonna kind of try to go through this. Atherosclerosis, or the process of forming blockages, is thought to be an inflammatory process. So what that means is that the immune system is involved. And the exact, I'm not gonna get down to the, the molecular part of it, but you, you do mount an immune response that starts with endothelial permeability, leukocyte migration, then you get foam cells, macrophages, you form something called a fibrous cap. And this is all within the, the wall of the blood vessel. Okay, so this is, it's within the wall of the pipe. And then what can happen sometimes is that the top cap can rupture. And then all those bad humors get released into the bloodstream and you can acutely form a clot which can lead to the, you know, the story of the, the sudden heart attack. You know, as I noted before, this is a progressive disease. What this, uh, what it is, is on the left hand, so these are, these are from autopsy studies in young people. So where did you get these? Well, I mean, I didn't get these, but these are actually from mostly motor vehicle accidents. And they consented to, there was an autopsy done, and so they took pieces of the aorta. I mean, what is the aorta? The aorta is the main gasket, the main blood vessel that comes off the heart. 
એને ડાયસેક કરીને ખોલીને દે લેડ ઇટ આઉટ ન વોટ યુર સીઈંગ હિયર ઓન ધી આઈ ગેસ ઇટ્સ કમિંગ ઓન ધ લેફ્ટ ઇઝ ધ પ્રેઝન્સ ઓફ ધોઝ ફેટી સ્ટ્રીક્સ ઇટ્સ ધીટ્સ ધી ઇનિશિયલ થિંગ ધેટ સ્ટાર્ટ્સ વેન ધીસ પ્રોસેસ ઓફ એથરોસ્ક્લરોસિસ સ્ટાર્ટ્સ એન્ડ યુ કેન સી ઇવન એઝ યંગ એઝ ફિફ્ટીન ધ નાઇન્ટીન યર્સ ઓફ એજ ધીસ પ્રોસેસ હેઝ સ્ટાર્ટેડ એન્ડ એઝ યુ એજ ઇટ ડઝ ઇન્ક્રીઝ હવે જે આ રાઇટ હેન્ડ સાઇડ ના પર છે that is a presence of raised lesions meaning if you were to move your hand over that you can start to feel it raised so it's building up within the vessel wall that takes a little bit more time but the point of this slide is that the process of atherosclerosis starts in your teenage years that's when it starts but just so tight so you know i i just i, I kind of want to explain to you what happens within the pipe the blood vessel there's kind of two things that can happen or two and a half one of them is called positive remodeling when you form a blockage again it is within the wall of the pipe and sometimes the pipe the vessel accommodates to open up and it does not impinge on the lumen the opening of the blood vessel this is called favorable remodeling but that can only occur to a point and then thereafter you get negative remodeling and that's when you're starting to limit flow This is a YouTube video. I hope it's going to play. Let's see what happens. Uh-oh. So this term is called Glagov's model. I'm just going to let it It's showing on my screen. So I am Dr. Anna Purnakini. I am the director of the cardiac cath lab at uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. So we actually did yellow one, yellow two in the past, essentially to understand what happens to the plaque morphology. So in uh, yellow one, we had this uh, hypothesis that if So I'm have a suit here this is the this is the blood vessel in cross section this is normal it's completely open and this is the same concept as before of ama the plaque has started that's okay the the lumen is still open you're still going to get flow how now the plaque has grown now this is still positive remodeling because the lumen has maintained but it can only compensate up to a point and now as you can see there's so much plaque it's shifted into the blood vessel uh oh and it has impinged into it Thank you. Right. So how does this process happen? That becomes one of the questions. 
So generally, it's with the risk factors that associate with it. I can't, there's three, the top three you can't change. That is your age. You can't change your sex. Male sex has more cardiovascular disease than female sex does. And you can't change your family. You can't run from your family. This is part of that. You cannot run from your family. But the rest of these are all, you know, there's modifiable risk factors. Diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, tobacco use, physical inactivity. These are all things that we can try to alter. I'm going to go through a few studies. I'll go through them very quickly. But diabetes is the absolute worst thing for your heart. This is a study from a New England Journal from, I think, uh, 1998 or something. It's called East by West. But the point I want to make here is that what they did is they took people who had had a prior heart attack, heart attack Teguche, and then they took people that had not had a heart attack but were diabetic, and then they followed those people out for seven years. Again, ek manas che ena pasa heart attack che pan diabetes natchi, no bijo manas che ke he has diabetes but he's not had a heart attack, and they followed them out for seven years to see what would happen. And the results are actually very, very interesting. So, interestingly, the person who was a diabetic who had not had a prior heart attack, they had more cardiovascular events moving forward than the person who had already had a heart attack before. I mean, it's, it's amazing, actually. I mean, the guy who'd had a heart attack before, who's non-diabetic, actually has a lower risk than the guy who is a diabetic. But that's what the data showed. In graphic form, this is going to be the orange line and the green line coming across. But that's what it's showing in graphic form right there. But then the next thing is, how do we predict the risk moving forward? Risk prognostication. Anybody know who this is? Johnny Carson. And bonus round. What character is he playing? So this is the great Karnak. Johnny Carson Sukartoto in a TV. It's a talk show. I'm, I'm aging myself. No, I don't think any of you guys will know. But he used to put on this outfit, and he would try to predict what is in the, in the note. But he was risk prognosticating. I mean, how do we do it? So we have a lot of scores that we use. There's something called the Framingham Risk Score that we use. J, uh, Dr. Diwan probably uses something called the Heart Score, and he calls us in the middle of the night, and he says, this guy's heart score is four, and you need to do this. But this is based on, it's a similar scoring system. Europe, Made use score and score two. American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association also have their own scoring system. But a lot of this boils down to common sense. Diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, and if you're having some symptoms, you're likely to have heart disease. And so that's what we try to use the best. One of the ones that we do use in cardiology, and there, for an upper app, you can Google this later if you want, is the ACC, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association Risk Estimator. You can input your own data, and you can see what your 10-year risk would be. There's testing that can be done to look as well. There's something called a stress echocardiogram. There's myocardial perfusion imaging. There's PET imaging. There's MRI. There's stress MRI. There's coronary CT angiogram. There's cardiac catheterization or angiography. There's exercise treadmill. And there's also something called coronary artery calcium scoring. And this is the last, this is the one I want to try to focus on. I've got coronary artery calcium Scoring suche. I've got process taiche of laying down plaque in the, in the artery, the formation of block, blockage formation. Part of that process, calcium is laid down within the artery. And this calcium is measurable. This has nothing to do with your calcium intake. Okay? So I'm not saying do it I'm not saying anything like that. It has nothing to do with your calcium intake. But in the, in the process of forming blockages, Calcium is laid down in the arteries, and this can be measured by a CT scan. CT scan suche. Maybe jelly explain karinako. A CT scan is an X-ray, but it is an X-ray from multiple different angles. 
There's 16 slice scanners, 16 x-rays at the same time. There's 256 slice scanners, 256 x-rays at the same time. If I'm 256 x-rays, Osate, you're getting a lot more data than just 16. But what the CT scan can do is it can count the amount of calcium you have. And that calcium count or that calcium score is a very good risk predictor of future cardiac events, heart attack, uh, death, things of that nature. A calcium, a calcium scoring, a couple of things that are good about it. It is actually pretty, it's rather low in radiation. A normal CT scan is about 15 millisieverts of radiation. Calcium scoring is usually around two to three. Imagine a score developed, it's, it's all algorithm based, computer based. But when you get a very nice report, you get a very nice score. Now, there's a couple of points I want to make. This is not going to tell you blockage or no blockage. That is not what it is going to tell you. It is simply going to tell you risk moving forward. But this is what the report will look like. It is generated very quickly. Uh, it's computer automated for the most part. A, a lot of centers will turn this around within 30 minutes to an hour. I mean, our score is not better. There's been a lot of studies done, a lot of data. But in short, if your score is less than 100, your risk in the next 10 years is rather low. If your score is greater than 300, most places use greater than 400, your risk of having a heart attack or worse is actually pretty high in the next 10 years. So how does this, I'm, and this is, I have a lot of slides coming up, I'm gonna go through them very quickly. How does this stack up compared to Framingham? I will tell you calcium scoring, in short, is superior to Framingham risk stratification. Um, this is a slide looking at basically uh, coronary events. Uh, these are hazard ratios, I'm not gonna get into it. But in short, if you have a very high calcium score of 1,000, your event rate is very high, and that's what this is showing. Your death rate is high, your MI rate is high, I mean, your heart attack rate, rate is high. Okay, let's go to the other side. The high, high score are you, your risk is high. What if my score is zero? Maybe it's true, alhamdulillah. If your score of zero and you don't have any risk factors, your five-year survival rate is 99.4%. Your 12-year survival rate is also 99.4%. So again, it helps tell you, are you on the high risk end or are you on a very, very low risk end? Uh, similarly, if you have a score of zero, it's actually superior to Framingham risk scores. It's superior to NCEP ATP3 scores. Um, and even if you don't have any cardiac risk factors, this risk stratifies you into a, into a, a, a lower quartile. Right? Nothing ever happens to us. So what about my community? What about South Asians? Well, it turns out we actually put down a lot of calcium, which means we have a lot of blockages. And what this, what this graph is here is showing is compared to other populations, white, black, Chinese, specifically the men, we have a lot of atherosclerosis, a lot of blockage formation, and that is measured by, we have a lot of positive calcium scores. This is a study out of Singapore. So there were many South Asians in this study as well. And basically what it's showing is the same thing. We have calcium laid down in the arteries, which means we have the process of forming blockages. Right, because we have to be cost conscious. So stress echocardiogram is going to cost out of pocket, I don't know, $450, $400. Nuclear study is going to cost $1,000 to $2,000. PET scans are around $3,000. MRI is probably around $2,000. Coronary CTAs, if you go through the insurance, so it'll be $2,000, $3,000. You can get it out of pocket for about $500, $600. Angiography is going to run you about $2,000 to $3,000. Exercise treadmill relatively affordable, $150, $300, somewhere in that range. Coronary artery calcium scoring. The cost is gonna be roughly out of pocket, 100, 100 to $140. Almost every country has adopted this model. The US has adopted it, Canada has, Europe, China, Australia. 
it's not just trying to predict disease. I'm not, the other way it helps, it might be us as well, but if you get, if your cholesterol is high and your calcium score is high, then you know you have the process. A lot of the countries are using it to justify, okay, let's start them on cholesterol medicine. And a lot of people need that push to see that, yes, I have the process, I should start the medicine. So what I'm going to posit to you is that calcium scoring is the most predictive coupled with the most cost-effective test for 10-year events. And this is specifically in an asymptomatic population. And what, what does asymptomatic mean? That means I don't have any symptoms. I'm not having chest pain. But I want to know my risk moving forward. I think, and this is patients without known cardiovascular disease. I mean, Ablogoshite, you've heard this talk before. Cholesterol control, karo, diabetes control, karo, a karo, te karo. We have a very active medical community. We have given these talks. But then it doesn't translate into anything. Within a 13 month span. And this was of cardi cardiovascular cause. But that you matma has say, the story is avice, but just what is on has pato, ne attack io, ne guzrigio. But we had two of these happen in Dallas within the in 12 months. But I, active members of our community, one was my neighbor, I will tell you, ne koi San Francisco si chiago, ab chide cabra se, hamna suta yo tagobi. To we wanted to see if we can do something actively to screen these people. And so we took this a step further. So about a year ago, we started this initiative, and it's not just me, Apnu Abjek Corona Group, Dr. Zefa Bai, Dr. Idris Bai Mogri, Dr. Mohammed Bai Mogri, Mustafa Bai Ali Bai, Salma Bin Saiger. We all kind of got together and so we could create a program. Our goal was to get every community member in Dallas between the ages of 40 and 65 without a known history of, of disease screened for coronary disease. And I'm gonna to try to share some of this data with you of what we came up with. Of a couple of things we did. The first thing we did is we, you know, you can't just say, go get this $300 test, okay? Because finances are an issue for everybody. So, we went to the one of the local hospitals, and the typical cost, as I told you, is between $100 and $150. We negotiated it down to $65. Okay? The second thing we did is that, and can I get it, you know, my doctor no order, Joyce, right? Because a lot of times you guys have a pres prescription or an order to get this done. We, they already had a program in place where we didn't need a doctor's order. They had to list a referring physician, or a doctor no nam la se, but you did not have to have a doctor's order to get this done. So this allowed the community to call themselves and schedule their own test. I don't know what's man, Jumatsi, we had sent these flyers out that this is all you need to do. And the process was very easy. There's no IV. Nothing like that. There's three electrodes that go on you. The CT scan itself takes 30 seconds. demographic information But from start to finish, most people were out within 45 minutes. No one's taking any blood. $35 cost up front. Then they were billed another 30 on the back end from the radiology service. But that was it. The result went to the physician that they listed. So what if they don't want you to have their data? So a lot of people put their own doctor. But as long as they had a referring physician, you did not need an order, you were able to get your test done. 
I can only share the data with you of people who listed me on as the uh, referring physician or the, or the, uh, 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 on that. Sorry, criteria, 40 to 65 years of age. And you're going to see in my data there are people that are over 65 as age because no one really listens and that people just went in anyway. You had to have one risk factor. You had to have diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, JB, any kidney disease, any risk factor, or a family history. Look at the amount of risk factors. Yes, my grandfather had coronary disease. As long as you check the right box, you're able to get it. And then we asked that they were asymptomatic. Again, score was generated, and this is our Dallas data. It's a, it's a, I, I just I want to share this with you. Alhamdulillah, most of our people in our Jumat had a score of zero, but not everybody. But most of them had zero. I'm sorry, age is on the uh, bottom, uh, on the x-axis, on the y-axis is calcium score. There's one that I want to give you an example, and I want to zero this in for you. This is a score of almost 600. And the other thing I want to point out, this is a 42-year-old male. Okay? And I want to tell you about a case now. I'm going to give you a 42-year-old male, active member of the Jumat. He has no risk factors whatsoever. He has no diabetes. He has no cholesterol. He has no kidney disease. He is a non-smoker. No risk factors. If anybody, like that Dallas mom, Abu Gaujo, we have a very active volleyball club, by the way. They play every sa Saturday or Sunday, Manakabranachi. But he was saying, I can't, you know, he went and had his score done, and his score came back high at 600. Abne safeguards be rakila, so if your score is high, you can call anyone within the group for a consultation about what to do. Okay, Chuck, you know, I've, I've actually been getting left hand pain. But I had a basketball injury. I didn't have to teach it. Playing basketball when I was very young. But I've been having left arm pain. Uh, I'm having left hand pain. You're not having symptoms. Let's bring you in the office this week for a treadmill stress test. Let's see. It could be absolutely nothing. Again, the score does not correlate with blockage or no blockage, but risk. So some people can have a high score without having a blockage. But we know your risk is high, so let's try to find out. Have it, two days later, before he's able to come in, he starts saying, It is, just doesn't feel right in here. I, I was having uneasiness. He WhatsApp called me three times. And for those of you who know, if you WhatsApp called me, you're not going to get a hold of me. I, he left me WhatsApp messages. I didn't see them. Text me, please, or regular call me. But he wisely went to the hospital. And when they drew blood, the blood data showed that he was actually having heart damage. We look at something called troponin, and that troponin level was elevated. So he was having a heart attack. He underwent an angiogram. Now, before I get to this angiogram, I want to kind of show the non-internist, the non-cardiologist, coronary anatomy 101. Blood vessels run on top of the heart. There's three main highways. There's the right coronary arteries, there's the left main, those kind of three, three and a half. Circumflex and the left anterior descending. But they run on top of the heart. We put dye into these blood vessels, we take an x-ray movie, and then that is gonna show us if there's a blockage or not a blockage. So this is the angiogram of the right coronary artery. Have Dr. Amr Jamali has already seen and he's salivating about what he's going to do with this. But I'm going to point these out for you very quickly. There's a blockage there. But this is, just think of it as a pipe. You're seeing the inside of the pipe, and all of a sudden you're seeing the pipe narrow down. You're seeing the pipe narrow down and open back up. That's where your blockage is. And he's got another one right there. This is a balloon with a stent to the distal part of the right coronary artery and also the proximal portion as well. 
And then this was the end product, which is pretty good. For comparison, before and after, this is what it looked like. I mean, you know, you could say that this was luck, but apnama me joyusha gani wakat joyusha. Kei tattoo asa apne. Na, me chen me kei utskilu. Or na, a city teacher, a city teacher, right? But when you know your calcium score is 600, you start to think differently. The yeah, other side is also true. The amount of calcium score low of if it's zero or three or five, the risk is ultra low. Then if you're having acidity, yeah, you can call it acidity and not worry about it. But I think the advantage of knowing what your risk is moving forward, you're less likely to write off chest symptoms. I don't know about that, you know, but the, we all do it, you know? Okay, Taiche, it may be something, it may be nothing, but if you know your risk is high, let, let's take a look, let's take a look at it. The question was, the, the question was, how big is the artery? The arteries are three millimeters, four millimeters, up to a centimeter. Different, si the different size individuals are going to have different size I'm sorry, not, yeah, it's probably bigger than that, but the different size individuals are going to have different size arteries. And Japanese stents, they're sized appropriately as well. We know the exact width of that. And so that's how we base how big the, uh, the stent we need to put in. So, uh, I'm going to go back a slide. I mean, it look to calcium scoring is not perfect. It's very, very good, but it's not perfect. It can miss something called soft plaque. And even if your score is zero, if you have a lot of risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, even if your score is zero, it has been shown that your event rate is a little higher. It's not high, but it's higher compared to people without any risk factors who have a score of zero. Because again, we were able to do this in the, in the Dallas Jumat, and we think, we, we hope we've made a difference, at least in this one individual, because we, we probably avoided something massive. But this can be translated to the other Jumats as well. So, you know, internist, cardiologist, I would encourage you to try to develop a similar model as well that you can take back to your Jumats to, to do things like this. Um, I, you know, the, the goal of these presentations is, again, is to share, you know, ideas share, Karia. How can we better things for the, the entire Jumat? Um, again, you need to ask your community, am I at risk? If you have risk factors, you're at risk. How can I get to better know my risk? Talk to your doctor. Get a calcium score. Talk to your internist or cardiologist. And I know we're short on time, so I'm just going to go ahead and end this. When you ask so I'll check questions, she. As you mentioned, K, you know, atherosclerosis uh, develops in the coronaries. My question is, what is the effect of 30 day of fasting in Ramazan in atherosclerosis? Does it dissolve the plaque to some extent or it has no effect? So, scientifically, I cannot answer that question for you. And if we theorize, it, it's got to improve it. Because, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I mean, insulin resistance, resistance, right? Fasting has shown uh, if, uh, so many positive effects um, that from a metabolic standpoint, it can't do anything but help. Have it, these divas ma dissolve tejai, probably rather unlikely. Not not dissolve, but at Gee. least it will shrink to some extent, and year after year fasting can cause significant reduction. Uh -huh. it, 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 uh, it's most, money, honestly, money, okay. th fasting no 30 days in Hawaii, long term, I, I'm not familiar with the data on that. What, what, I, what I can tell you is that, you know, it's, statins medicine, Hawaii, right, the cholesterol medicines, that can regress it. I know that anything that, in, that improves the metabolic health, because again, it's an inflammatory process, 
can definitely help. So, आप आप जे वाट करो तो जनाब, it's probably right. I mean, you're probably able Because to regress heard, a plaque. Because I heard that they have done the studies and hmm. they've shown that it's in the controller. It reduces the plaque size, and year after year fasting is very very useful. हाँ, it's and a number two question. जी. If you don't mind. हाँ हाँ, of course. के A one C जे लेवल छे, now what is the cut off level where the cardiac disease or cardiac risk factor increases from what level like uh, yeah. normally so, is 5.7 so what level do you suggest will be the yeah, cut off yeah so the, the just to, to, to if i may clarify a little bit you know at, at what level are we going to start to see this problem basically for sugar control Correct. i mean our country my diabetes is defined as an a1c basically greater than 6.5 and if there's any endocrinologist please correct me Um, impaired fasting glucose is usually 5.7, either 5.8 right. up to 6.5. Correct. The process, quite frankly, is probably developing at the lower end, 5.6, 5.7, because we do know that this process starts in our youth, uh, when we're teenagers, basically. So, uh, if I can theorize, I think any, you know, if, if you have impaired, you know, that, that slide I showed you again, don't become a diabetic. The time to attack it is when you are having impaired fasting glucose. I mean, it it, it just just don't become a diabetic because it's it's worse than having a heart attack before. I mean, that's how bad it is. So just don't become a diabetic. And what is there a cutoff uh, level? It, that where it starts? I mean, I, I, again, I'm not familiar with the data, okay. but I would have to say 5.7 or somewhere in that range. Go endocrinologist today that can answer that question for me, or a lipidologist that could answer that question. And final question: okay, I completely agree with you. The calcium scoring, we also do it, hmm. but not commonly done because the insurance doesn't cover. Why insurance doesn't cover? Well, they, I think they're not covering it because it's so low cost that uh, it'll actually. No, I'm not So they will cover it actually. They will cover it, but they're they're going to charge you four hundred dollars, three hundred to four hundred dollars. But if you have multiple risk factors. Most, at least in our in our clinic, they will cover it, but the out-of-pocket cost is actually cheaper. Because I mean, you know, I've made insurance got issue. You have your 20%. You know, you have a $3,000 deductible, right? And then you have 20% co-insurance. If the insurance cost is $500, I'm not clinic. I can tell you, we tell people just to do it out of pocket. Yeah, I agree. But they will cover it. You have to have a risk factor, but it will be done. Uh, you know. It's it's easier for us if people get it done out of pocket because we have paperwork. My about you, Jaycee, but um, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a rather affordable test. So we we have not had that experience about the coverage. Okay, Shukran. Shabir Bhai sahab, you have a question jay hatu, okay, what is the cutoff? So, if you have a diabetic A1C, if you're still having manifestations of diabetes, generally speaking, we want the A1C to be less than 6.5. But let's say, for example, you have A1C 6.3, chai. and if you have a diabetes and manifestations, thai chai. it needs to be even lower than that. So you keep reducing the A1C as much as possible to reduce the diabetic manifestations. This is especially, Moise, by correct me if I'm wrong, but cardiovascular disease, ma, the diabetic manifestations are more microvascular They are than macrovascular. That is correct, yes. So, jitlu bhi tamaru glycemic control hoi, itlu jtamne karabu par se, to lower it. I'm gonna, if we, if we just pick you back up. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Two strikes, uh, give me one more, give me one. Due to time, and we have people that do need to catch flights, we're going to save the questions for after all the talks. If we have time then, then the questions will come back on. Okay. Moise, thanks, thanks so much for that wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, thanks so much. I want to take a moment to introduce our next speaker, Um, he's got another great inspiring initiative and another great story to tell us. Uh, Dr. Mufadal Gombera is an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon 
specializing in arthroscopy and the treatment of injuries to the shoulder, hip, and knee. Uh, Mfotobai is the director of the Hip Preservation Center at Texas Orthopedic Hospital. He's on the board of directors for Fondren Orthopedic Group, MIST. He instructs trainees and fellow surgeons at his institution and a variety of courses throughout the country. Uh, uh, Mufadlubai is a teaching physician at UT, uh, the University of Texas Medical Branch, where he serves as an assistant professor. He's very passionate about injury prevention, maintaining mobility, and empowering Mominin to lead healthy and active lifestyles. Um, Dr. Mufadl Kumbayarla. Shukran everyone, especially to uh, SVMA for allowing me to uh, present this. Um, I have the Azim Sharaf of sharing our experience in delivering a fitness and nutrition barnamaj in uh, uh, Ajamrit Asafia, Nairobi. Um, we had this opportunity about three months ago, so um, from 14th to 16th Zilkad. This date we had decided probably about uh, almost a year ago on this specific date and to uh, add uh, icing on the cake, it was the same weekend that Molana uh, arrived in Mombasa and called all of Jamia to Mombasa. And because Jamia had uh, stopped their curriculum and made us, our, our Barnamaj, the curriculum for those two days, they allowed us to continue our program and deliver it in Mombasa um, under Akamola Saya Mubarak, which was literally a dream come true. Other dream is gonna be our dream team here. I'm so thankful for the people uh, that, that uh, put this together and made it happen. It, it was actually a beautiful thing. Anytime I took Jamia's name, anyone I asked about this program said yes. It just sort of grew organically. We started with four people and you can see it kind of snowballed, but it wouldn't be possible without everyone here, Dr. Sakawala, Dr. Barmo, Dr. al Kamari, who's here and basically does everything everywhere all the time. Dr. Dr. Punawala and Dr. Punawala, um, and uh, also here Hamza Raja, Alifia Milwala, Sakina, Sakina Chiba, and Sakina, uh, Sakina Bin Raja. Every person had committed just to go to Nairobi for that weekend, and so we're all thankful that we got to present it um, in Mola Sazirat. So why do we do this? What was the idea? In Miladwa's last year, Sayyidina Mufaddu Saifuddin turned to the Khidmat Guzaro and, and doing zikr said, ke aham aham amal Imam Hussain ni zikr she. And Pachi farmayu ke tamisagla tamaro pure puri taqat a amal ma lagaujo. And so that was our marching order that as physicians, as orthopedists, as a, a physical medicine specialists, how can we enable people to apply their puri puri taqat specifically to this amal? So the cornerstones of physical health, people get so tired of hearing doctors talk about the same thing, diet, exercise, diet, exercise, but it is so important, um, especially in our community. In general, the majority of doctor visits seem to happen for musculoskeletal issues. Uh, basically one in two people will end up seeing the doctor for some sort of muscul musculoskeletal issue in their uh, lifetime. This is becoming more and more prevalent in Muminin. We're moving away from Muminin ni Jamaat and we're becoming Kurstiwala ni Jamaat. It is a problem that's frankly a little troubling. Just to give you guys some information, in ladies in Ashara this year, over 20% of women had requested some sort of chair or rahat assistance. That's a lot of people. It's 20% of people. That probably means we're really bad orthopedic surgeons, but that's, that's where we are. And if we really wanna tackle this problem, we need to look forward. So we really need to talk about prevention. How do we even prevent this from happening? If we want this change to happen throughout Muminin, the idea was to start at the fountainhead, to look at the future leaders, and that is what turned our attention towards Jamia. More importantly, as Dr. Moyes Bai showed, um, it's the formative early years, the, uh, teenage years and beyond, that can start to affect uh, people's lives, the lifestyles, and their health. So to define what the issue is, we surveyed Talabat and Talabat before going to Nairobi. And one of the key questions we asked was how many hours a week do they actually exercise? In Talabat, about 50% said that they exercise less than two hours a week. And in Talabat, it was 68% said they less, exercise less than two hours a week. One of their primary endurances, sorry, one of their primary um, barriers was they usually said they were busy with other work. 
And, the, and another half said that they were just too tired to do, uh, to do anything else. So we created this program that happened over three days. Um, the introduction was based off Matam and how we can apply our body towards this puri puri taqat. We discussed why fitness is critical and how staying fit allows the khidmat guzara to perform akamol as khidmat. Um, uh, talked about posture, how posture starts uh, the foundation of fitness and how especially for movement it is so important uh, to prevent back and knee pain. We had a brainstorming session where we tapped into the um, ideas and the creativity of, of Talibat and Talibat to figure out how they can make real change, not just for themselves, but for Jamaats across the, across the world. We had a nutrition game show to teach the difficult concepts of nutrition. We had a session about practical daily tips, not to be super lofty, but just what a little changes we can make every day. We did a boot camp. And of course, one-on-one -on -one consultations for uh, over 200 uh, Talibat, Talibat, and Asatiza came for one-on-one -on -one consultations. As we mentioned, the cornerstones were physical fitness. We talked about endurance, uh, both cardiovascular strength as well as muscular strength. Talked about flexibility, body composition. And uh, again, this is some of the information that we presented to them. Why are we presenting to a very young audience that is otherwise generally fit? Some of the issues, medical issues, such as heart disease, can actually start the days that they're walking into Jamia in Owala. To turn our attention back to this slide, majority of Talibat exercise less than two hours a week. While we know that the recommendation to uh, improve blood circulation and decrease any sort of heart-related issues is actually two and a half hours uh, of aerobic exercise a week. In addition, exercise has a, a very tangible difference in people's longevity. Um, just every 10 additional minutes of exercise that you can add uh, reduce people's mortality by 7% year over year. And to tackle this concept that people were too busy with work or too tired, we present a study that was performed in uh, people who were dealing with office fatigue. And they, they took those people and divided the group in half Half of the group underwent an exercise intervention for six weeks, and half of them stayed at their baseline level. And 93% of people that felt office fatigue noticed that it either improved or resolved. And more importantly, they noted improved cognitive function, improved multitasking, better sleep, better efficacy, and more motivation to do what they want to do. We also talked about uh, change in bone mass. The formative years of our peak bone, bone mass happens at a much younger age than, than uh, we anticipate. And as people graduate from Jamia, as they get busy with khidmat, they get busy with their pro uh, professional lives, as this focus goes away, it, it sort of drops. And if we don't keep up with our exercise, we don't keep up with, nutri with the nutrition, we start to see the issues develop with poor bone health, and then we're just playing catch up instead of playing prevention. So muscle strength both decreases with age, bone density decreases with age, this is something we cannot fix, but we can um, perform safe resistance exercise to ensure that we maintain what we are given. Flexibility also tends to decrease with age. However, regular stretching, maintaining motion is critical. And if we look as matam as an example, using mola as kalam, it is a true full body exercise where if we want to continue this uh, and apply our puri puri takat, we have to maintain flexibility, strength, and motion throughout the body. Lastly, we touched on nutrition the importance of a balanced meal, making sure that the meal itself is not too heavy, making sure it's timed correctly, and how it's important fuel for the body and overall um, improves your body composition. These are some pictures from our presentations. This is the least medical talk, mostly because as an orthopedist, I don't really remember any medicine, so. This is the one-on-one -on -one consultations, and of course, when in Africa, some mishkaki is is necessary. We tried to present practical information. We gave everyone these flyers. One was a five-day workout routine, something they could simply do using only body weight exercises, not having to go to a gym. The longest exercise was 10 minutes and five days a week. And also information about nutrition sometimes can be a difficult concept to grab, but why those small daily choices can make a difference, not just for themselves, but if we ingrain these changes and this mentality, we, we wanted to permeate through um, when they become umalo, through their local jamaats, if they become muallimin, um, how it affects uh, uh, the food that happens in madrasa. 
So, of course, most importantly, did we actually accomplish anything? We were very thankful for some of this, for some of this wonderful feedback. This is directly uh, that Talabat and Talabat shared um, with their Asatiza that then shared it with us. And the most important thing was our group got to Araz that we were there in Jamia in front of Mola. Mola Sagla Upar Nazar Farmayu, Mola Dua Mubarak Farmayu, and we got to discuss our program with Busaiba. Busaiba asked for a report um, on what we presented, why we presented it. And two days after submitting this report, we got an official misal, a Mola Dua Mubarak Farmayu Che, with all our team members, all our team members' names. After Ashara, Jamia then in, uh, incorporated a new schedule where they reduced their day by 30 minutes to try to have people use 30 minutes more every day for exercise, for rest, or for any additional um, thing that they would want to use it for. Nutritious foods were prioritized in the canteen, and the canteen was now closed during morning break. A lot of times what, was, what we realized was people were skipping breakfast because they were tired. They would then have a, a sugary snack uh, at break at 10.30 in the morning and come lunchtime, it was just a crash. They would overeat and in the, in, in the later afternoon classes, they were just basically um, nodding off and very tired. A directive was given that every student should look after their own physical, mental, and emotional health and then they really worked hard to reduce white rice and carbohydrates. This happened not only in Nairobi Jamia, but this was a directive that came from Jamia head office in all four campuses. Our future steps is we hope to do a follow-up survey with Nairobi Talabat Talabat. We're doing a nutritional follow-up with Moaid itself. Um, a physical and mental health sub-department is now being created that incorporates Moaid, Khemat, and Malu Shifa. Uh, one of the ideas that came out of this was to create a consultation network for Malu Shifa to reach out to specialist physicians. Uh, we're hoping to recruit some volunteers from this organization to help in this effort. Uh, Busaiba said for us to do future programs on all four campuses and one thought was to actually track, get data using fitness trackers as to what levels of exercise, degree of exercise, talabat, talabat they're actually doing. And then this year during Ashara we got further marching orders. As Mola said on Pashmi Tariq, Te thori thori varzish roz so utilizing this, our directive from Jamia head office was during istifada this year, we need to define what warzish and exercise is and help Talabat, Talabat and Asatiza understand what, how to apply Mola's Kalam in a very practical aspect. Also talk about practical nutritional changes not just cutting out all sugar, not just uh, avoiding uh, all carbohydrates, but how do you make small changes that make a big difference? Identify activities for exercise for both students and for Asatiza. How do I d identify those people uh, that are high risk, such as using BMI, uh, obesity, or other screening tools? And then create a working plan specifically for high risk individuals. Lastly, one more time, I wanna thank our team. It's amazing work that everyone is doing, and I couldn't be more thankful. Chale apne dua kariye. Mola aap yari apo ya me hamare chale saas tak hamare aham aham amal Imam Hussain ni zikar ma apne puri puri taqat wote laga bhi sakye ane aap madad kariye ki aap mumini ne bhi a amal ma yari dey sakye. Shukran. No, rice is our staple, and like you said, cut down white rice. What if we were to say that every place you know, use only brown rice? Brown rice is an option. Um, there are some logistical issues with brown rice, but more importantly, it's, it's how much rice to take. Why is overeating rice an issue? Um, this is a simple thing like jaman puru karu joy. So you take as much as you need and stopping when you no longer feel hungry as opposed to just continuing to eat until you feel full, especially at night. So just those little changes that can make a big difference. So if it's not practical to change all your rice to brown rice, then 
it's okay if you have white rice, especially if you're in a small town, but why is it important to just keep track of this? Thank you so much, Mufadabai. Thank you so much. Amazing, amazing work.